Welcome back to Tailored Materials. You can see I haven't changed my shirt since last time. That's because I'm doing it immediately afterwards. That at least means that I can remember what we were talking about. What we were talking about, or what I was talking about, is when we have a layer of different materials. So we have something that we will now consider to be iron. So let us have iron zero. If we have a block of iron and we put it in a air environment, then we can imagine there is a thermodynamic tendency for the iron to become iron three oxide. That would be um, FeOOH, for example. That would be our outside layer. So we can imagine our outside layer is going to be, let's make a thin one, that's going to be Fe, FeOOH, which has two, three um, pluses. So this is uh, this is iron three. But we have iron zero at the centre. So if we put that in contact with our iron zero, we would expect there to be some kind of disproportionation, the iron three and the iron zero to react with each other to form iron two. So we can't really connect those directly together. What we need is some kind of mixture, and we can think of that as a transition from one material to the next. So down here, we would expect to see iron two oxide, so this will be FeO, for example, and then somewhere in between, we would expect to see the normal oxide that we consider, which is magnetite, which is Fe3O4, which has exactly two, so this is one, uh, two, three. So this is two, and this is two, three. This is the normal iron oxide rust, but normal iron oxide rust doesn't exist in connection with the atmosphere. In connection with the atmosphere, we mean typically thermodynamically anyway, we would expect there to be, there's a big scratch, we would expect there to be iron three. And if we're connected to iron zero, we would expect there to be iron two. So we would expect some kind of gradient in these materials. So in between these materials, there will be less defined materials. And also here at the interface to the iron, we would expect also to find a less defined material. What does this all take us to? So if we, I'm trying to think of a way of doing this because I've drawn it vertically, let's have the vertical axis as the voltage. Um, and we consider this to be the surface, then we can imagine that the voltage um, oxidation is near, just have oxidation up at the top. So then we can consider there to be some kind of profile of voltage from our iron, which is trying to hold the voltage and its iron naught, iron two couple. And the outside, which is the oxygen in the air, trying to hold the voltage at the oxygen to uh, oxygen uh, dot. So the reaction of oxygen uh, couple effectively. And in between those, we've got all these other chemicals. This is a dynamic process. So the iron is corroding. So this border is moving into our iron. Iron naught is becoming iron two. And here at this border, iron two is becoming iron three. And here at this border, our iron, well, all the way through here, our iron two is becoming iron three. And then at the surface, we have our cap, which is iron three hydroxide, depending on how far that can penetrate into our surface. That is what we would expect, but obviously iron is a bit of a problem because it tends to crack, and so we end up with a much more complicated structure than this. Let us think about aluminium. Aluminium doesn't have this. It's one of the reasons why um, aluminium oxide is relatively stable, and why aluminium is a, what, a better material in many respects to, to iron. Uh, it's worse in other respects. So on the surface of our aluminium, let's do the same side, we will have 
aluminium oxide, Al2O3. And aluminium only has one oxidation state, that's a plus three state, so it can't form these other components in between. But it could have some aluminium zero in the aluminium oxide. However, aluminium oxide is not very good at doing that. So aluminium oxide behaves like a good insulator. So now we've got our similar diagram, but in our similar diagram we have a higher voltage difference because the aluminium is more electronegative, it's more electropositive, it's more reactive, and our air is the same point, so this was the same height, but the aluminium comes in lower, and there's nothing so exciting happening here. So we've got here, we've got changes in conductivity, because we've got different real materials in between, and here we don't have that. It makes the aluminium a bit simpler to deal with. And let's have a third case, which I can just fit on over here before I have to rub everything off. Let's take zinc, let's make it the same way around. Zinc, obviously all of these could be on the same now uh, it would be symmetrical, it would be all the way around if it's a block, but I'm only doing one side. So if we take our zinc, we would form zinc oxide, which is ZNO, zinc 2 oxide, and that is fine. We obviously need something at the surface again, which I forgot on my aluminium oxide, so we need something at the surface, so this is um, also AlOOH, probably, some kind of hydroxide. And here on the zinc oxide, we would also form ZnOH2, maybe, because we need to cap our zinc oxide and not have any dangling bonds. What we need here on our zinc oxide is a different thing, because uh, unlike aluminium, zinc oxide can contain zero, zinc zero um, error states in it. That means that we have the same argument as with iron, that the concentration of zinc extra atoms, zinc adder atoms, to our zinc oxide is high near the zinc, because the zinc zero reduces the zinc two, and so it generates zinc atoms as interstitials, or just errors. Uh, so not interstitials, but as as, um, ad, ad, as a replacement for the normal atoms in the crystal structure of the zinc oxide, and they make it conduct more. So now our zinc oxide is going to have not a straight line of conductivity. Let's put the zinc oxide here. It's going to have a curve because the, at the start where there's no uh, where there's a lot of zinc. It's quite conductive, so its steepness is low. And then when it becomes non-conductive, its steepness is high, um, and then maybe it goes right up. So the zinc hydroxide is not very conductive either, but up near the surface we may have another con more conductive layer that has too much oxygen in it. That would be a p-doped uh, yeah, kind of a little bit weird, but it would have um, positive um, errors in it because it would have too much oxygen, it would be too reducing, so it would have missing electrons, and here at near the zinc it would have extra electrons, it will be the normal type of conductor. It depends what we're trying to conduct, obviously. Here we have, uh, we, uh, we have electrons trying to go out, so this bit is particularly conducting and this bit, which would be conducting, if it was um, an electron coming the other way, is not very conducting, obviously, is no better than the bit below it. So we don't get an increase in conductivity in the direction that we're trying to do things. If we want to go in the other direction, we would see that this outside bit blocks it better, uh, or no, sorry, conducts it better, and the inside bit blocks it. But that's not what we're trying to do. If we... So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just take the aluminium because it's simpler and we will look at what happens 
if we stress it. So here we are, back to the same diagram. What happens if I take my aluminium and I stress it? I can stress it by applying an electrode to this side and applying an oxidizing potential, which will push this up against its will. Or we can stress it by in changing the atmosphere. Let us do the atmosphere first. So let us just make the atmosphere more oxidizing. We could do that by changing the concentration of oxygen in it. If we change the concentration in the atmosphere, we move this point up. But the conductivity of the aluminium, aluminium oxide, sorry, the conductivity of the aluminium oxide remains the same. So to keep the same angle, we have to go up to here, which means that we will grow some more aluminium oxide. The aluminium oxide will typically get thicker if we put it into a more oxidizing atmosphere. Once we've got it to this thickness, the rate of oxidation doesn't go to zero, but it goes down very, very much because the driving force is this voltage. And the voltage near the surface is the voltage that the outside atmosphere wants it to have, and the voltage in the middle is the voltage that the aluminium wants it to have. If we deliberately do this, we can generate a surface that is more thick, sorry, an interface, a coating that is thicker than you would expect. So if I take my aluminium and I attach it to an electric voltage supply, I can make the oxide layer grow. And then I've got a thicker oxide layer than aluminium would normally grow, and that makes it more stable because then our angle, the voltage drop, is higher, and then we have very little driving force for it to do anything. If we do it with the atmosphere, we can do exactly the same. We can just make it more oxidizing. Obviously, if I do it by increasing the voltage, I am doing the same thing, but my uh, maximum doesn't go up. The starting point goes up. Um, yeah, the starting point goes down. Sorry. So if I move it down, then I would obviously steepen this, but I'm going to here as well. So I would make the distance the same. So much for that. But obviously, a more common situation or a more easy situation to reach would be heating up. So here I am with my aluminium and my Al2, oops, Al2, O3. And I can think about what happens if I heat up the system without changing any of the other parameters. I would expect two things to happen. The first thing that will happen is the conductivity of this semiconductor, or non-conductor, will go up. The conductivity of the semiconductor might go down if we heat it up but it would have to be very doped. Typically, semiconductors increase in conductivity when you heat them up, and non-conductors may increase in conductivity when you heat them up. Aluminium oxide is quite non-conducting, so we would have to heat it up an awful lot to make it conduct. So that is not what's going to happen. But what is going to happen is the mobility of aluminium inside the aluminium oxide, and the mobility of oxygen dot inside the aluminium oxide is going to increase. So although our point where the force, the driving force making the bulk material grow has been reached, if we heat it up we can make it grow because the rate at which these are going to move is going to be higher so they can get through more with less force. So then Although this force is, uh, also although our conductivity is fine, our voltage is fine, they, the um, atoms in here can now move under this gradient, and so we will end up with a thicker layer. If we take something like zinc oxide, the conductivity of the layer will also go up, and so we will have two effects which will both combine to make a thicker layer. Typically, if we have a, um, so I'm trying to think of a good example, but I can't think of one apart from forging. So if we take a piece of iron, 
and we heat it up, it changes colour, and the colour change is due to the thickness of the oxide layer, and the thickness of the oxide layer is effectively a record of how hot the material got, because for the same reason as here, we reach very rapidly a po position where the gradient of this change of voltage is not enough to force these atoms to move anymore, so we end up with a re relatively um, fixed thickness of oxide. Obviously, if we leave it for a really, really long time, it will get thicker, but it, the rate of growth goes down very rapidly, so we can very easily make a fixed thickness. If we take a silicon wafer, we go to a shop and buy a silicon wafer, you typically buy them with a certain thickness of oxide on. Zero is not reasonable, so they're heated to a certain temperature in an oven to generate a reproducibly thick layer of oxide, typically 100 nanometers. Aluminium is uh, delivered after being treated, and it is not like that because it's been cut and polished and things, so aluminium will have a native layer which is grown at room temperature, and if we want to get a reproducible layer, we either have to warm it up, but that's difficult with aluminium because the melting point of aluminium is quite low, and the resistivity of the aluminium oxide and its resistivity to aluminium going through it is quite high. An easier way to do it is to attach it to a power supply and do it in a liquid. If we consider this other thought experiment where we take an aluminium electrode that's got native oxide on it, and we put it into some water that contains salts that don't dissolve the aluminium oxide, otherwise we will end up with a new problem. And we connect it to another electrode, so we want to make this one uh, positive to make the aluminium dissolve, and we'll make our other electrode negative, this could be carbon or something. Then we will cause the aluminium to corrode, so if we put it in, it will react first of all in immediately with the water to form a layer of aluminium oxide and aluminium hydroxide that is enough to prevent the normal voltage, the own voltage of the aluminium, aluminium from corroding it faster. So then it reaches this on pass, it's a slow point in our reaction. And then we can make it worse again by applying more positive voltage. Aluminium has quite a high voltage anyway, and quite a high electrochemical potential of its own, of about 3 volts as far as I can remember. And then we can crank it up higher, obviously we can apply quite high voltages. Typically what happens is our aluminium oxide then just gets thicker. And then we reach the same state again. What we're doing is the voltage that we're applying is burned in the resistance of the new layer. So all we see, if we measure, uh, let's, I'm going to have to do draw two. So this is time. If I apply a voltage over time, so I apply no voltage and then I step like that so that we can see something happen, then obviously our current drawing it positive and not worrying about where the amateur is and which way around it is to, for the time being. Our current is obviously going to also go up when our voltage goes up because we are oxidizing the aluminium. We're going to get a lot of current flow. And depending on the rate, so let's have it, let's have it a bit lower. So that it's, uh, let's have it up to there. So then we've got a current, then uh, it will drop slowly because we are making it thicker and thicker. So the driving force, the voltage is going down and down. Um, and then it will go down again to zero, or not quite zero, um, where it was before. Because this is much higher than the background corrosion of the aluminium, which is generating current anyway, we see um, mostly this excitement. This usually goes off scale and breaks our current meter because we're more interested in this bottom piece.
if we want to know how much extra we made, we would have to integrate under this under this peak to get the um, number of electrons. So we have current times time, and then we multiply it by Faraday's constant to work out how many electrons we've passed, and then we could work out how thick we've made this layer if nothing else is happening. In a normal case, obviously, other things are happening too. So this is overlaid with other problems. If we're trying to make an aluminium oxide layer, we typically do that in a sulfuric acid solution. So I'm now going to make this H2SO4, but not concentrated. That dissolves aluminium oxide, just not very fast. So now if we go to aluminium oxide, uh, if we go to this one, we now have a bigger baseline. So let's take this bit off. And now we are have a baseline. We've got some current where, which flows when we do um, nothing at all. Effectively, our aluminium would dissolve continually as the aluminium oxide is etched off the surface. And the rate of the aluminium dissolution is only dependent on the rate of etching of the aluminium oxide. So it's being removed from this face um, and then it's oxidizing in the bottom and that reacts with the water. It's not going to react with the sulfuric acid, but it's in water. So the water will then lose its hydrogen. So hydrogen will bubble off and we will form aluminium oxide to replace the aluminium oxide that's dissolving. That's what this current is here, this current. But the same thing happens. Obviously, this is not to scale because I just made it up. The same thing almost identically happens as it would in a um, non-dissolving state, just shifted up by the dissolution current. So now we apply a voltage, it makes the aluminium oxide thicker, and then it continues to grow thicker until it gets back down to a steady state where it stops growing again. This allows us to grow a thickness of aluminium oxide that we want. And we deliberately do it in this sulfuric acid solution because it preferentially etches in certain ways so that we end up with a porous structure. That's good for a lot of purposes. It makes it more resistant and it allows us to color it. So um, bicycle parts, for example, are colored. I'm looking at my tripod, but it isn't colored. Parts of your camera might be colored as well. It might be colored aluminium, which is porous aluminium oxide filled with dye. We will do an experiment on that later, probably. But what I'm interested in for the time being is this combined problem that we've got the things happening in the electrolyte plus the things happening at the interface of our electrode, which is common to corrosion-related electrochemistry. Obviously, if we're interested in the solution, so in the case of measuring um, something in the solution like caffeine or ascorbic acid, so vitamin C, or um, maybe metal ions, then we want our electrode to do nothing. So we would choose an electrode that doesn't have a big current because then we won't be able to see what's happening in the solution. If we're interested in the corrosion, then obviously we want our solution to do less exciting stuff because the more stuff that happens, the more other signals that we have on top of this. Okay, this is much shorter this time, but I think this is a good time to stop.